This video will describe using your Medmont E300 corneal autographer alongside the B-Free and CAT-MC orthokeratology designs. My name is Randy Kojima and we're going to start by talking about the optimal ways to capture and collect topography data to construct your ortho K lenses. And this is applicable to all orthokeratology designs and any time you're collecting maps to build a rigid contact lens from your Medmont topographer. The first step is to assume that because we're capturing on tear film and not the actual cornea, that it's easy for there to be air with that moving and dynamic tear film with a patient that's never 100% steady and certainly an eye that isn't 100% steady. So take two images on the visual axis and what that means is have the patient look right down the axis of their of the cone of the topographer right in the center ring and you're going to take two of those images. You'll notice that the topography will tend to favor one side of the eye or the other. And what I mean by that is if we look at the single topography capture, patient is fixated right down the center at the center ring. The rings seem to hit the nasal side, but we're missing a bit of the temporal side. And that's due to angle kappa and the fact that our fovea is temporally displaced. So our topographies end up appearing a little bit nasal. Now this is good to understand the powers that are distributed through the pupil and along the visual axis, both pre-ortho K and post-ortho K, but it's also helpful to get a geometric capture to understand where the eye is displaced in relationship with the visible iris. So what you'll do is have the patient fixate one to three rings to their nose until this placido appears center, centered. So here we have our two visual axis captures. Then we're going to take two geometric captures by asking the patient to look or fixate one, two, or three rings toward the nose. That better centers the placido reflection to the visible iris. So we have a geometrically centered capture. And you'll see that in these two images where the placido in both appears like it's laterally well centered. It's not decentered to the nasal side. So we have two captures on the visual axis, two on the geometric axis. Then we're going to take one in each of the principal directions. So having the patient fixate up to four rings to the nose and that pushes the placido far to the temporal side. Then we'll have the patient fixate one, two or three rings toward their ear, maybe up to four rings and that'll push the placido rings to the nasal side. Then we're going to have the patient look up approximately three to four rings. That'll push the placido down to the bottom and then lastly have the patient look down and that'll push the placido to the top. So now we have eight images in various fixations but all of them contributing information in the center because all of the topographies have rings that are covering the apex of the eye. So by merging all eight of these images together we can get a wider view of the cornea. We can also have an averaging of all those topographies. So let's go up to analysis and composite eye. What the software will do is it'll string together all of these eight topographies, merge them into one singular larger view. So when you see your composite capture, now you're getting almost 100% of the cornea. And when we consider that ortho K lenses are typically 10, 5 to 11 millimeters in diameter, it's important that our capture is as large as we possibly can make it. Now, one of the 
first things that we might do after we've taken our capture is determine if we have apical or limbus to limbus astigmatism. This patient appears to have apical corneal cylinder. If we look at the K readings, we can see that the corneal sill is 1.37 diopters. It's not exceptionally high, but is this a patient that requires a toric ortho K lens? And with only 1.37 diopters of corneal sill, that wouldn't appear to be needing a toric landing to the lens. But when you look at the sagittal differential at eight millimeters, in other words, what's the height of the cornea across the flat meridian? Then 90 degrees perpendicular, what's the height of the cornea across the steep meridian to an eight millimeter cord? When you subtract the height horizontally or along the flat and the height vertically, along the steep, the difference in microns is 33. When your sagittal differential is greater than 30 microns, that's typically where a toric lens will align better to the peripheral cornea, create better centration, better comfort, and better hydraulic force to push the astigmatism out of the way. So 30 microns or greater, and you will consider using a toric B-free lens. Now the next step is to build our contact lens and draw the information out of the Medmont that we need to construct a B-free or CAT MC lens. And the way to do that is to convert this composite eye into what's called an ideal eye. The composite topography takes into account as much of the cornea as it can read. And the cornea is never symmetric, whereas our ortho K lenses are always symmetric. Even if they're toric, one hemisphere will be a mirror of the other hemisphere, and the opposing meridians will be mirrors of each other. So they're symmetric on opposing sides in a toric, they're symmetric 360 degrees around in a non-toric. So to best predict the ideal parameters and the fit of the lens, then you're going to go to Analysis and select Ideal Eye. And what that'll do is it'll convert your topography into a smooth and symmetric surface. So when you pull up your contact lens, it will Per best predict the pattern that you are likely to see on eye. One of the things that we can't do with topography is estimate exactly where the lens will position. What is the natural resting place of a contact lens? Where does it find its equilibrium based on the asymmetry of the eye? And what the ideal eye does is it allows us to best predict, predict the landing and lift of the lens, assuming a symmetric surface, so assuming where the contact lens might actually center. So let's next drop our lens on eye. We'll go to Home and Contact Lens. Then we'll select from the manufacturers the CAT design group where the B Free and CAT MC were developed from. Then under Designers, you're going to select the B free if this is for a adult or when you need a large treatment zone. When you're dealing with myopia control, then you want the smaller treatment area. So let's select the myopia controlling optics of the CAT MC. We punch in our RX and then click OK. What the software will do is it'll place that rigid contact lens on eye, that reverse geometry ortho K lens, in this case the CAT MC, and will predict for you the ideal parameters that will best match this eye surface and give you an assessment or an understanding of the fluorescein pattern. So the first thing that we might do is determine the visible iris diameter. So let's select the appropriate CAT MC or B free lens diameter by going to annotate, grab our ruler, 
then we'll find two opposing meridians where we can see white to white. So we'll click our cursor on the one side, dragging that line through the center to the opposing side. Click your cursor again, and that'll bring up the visible iris or the diameter across the diagonal here. And it's good to take a oblique or diagonal measurement because that gives you a good average of the longer horizontal, the shorter length of the vertical that studies indicate most eyes have. Longer horizontal diameter, shorter vertical. We get a good average of the two. So it's coming up 12.31. Let's enter in under the VID 12.3. The software selects for us an 11.2 diameter. We can alter the diameter if we so choose, but you can assume that the lens diameter would be as your consultant would construct the B-free or CAT-MC based on the measured VID. Now another thing that we can do is we can select the very small 5.0 optic zone or the slightly larger 5.5. Remember that conventional ortho-K lenses are built with a 6 millimeter optic zone. The CAT-MC allows us to construct a smaller and smaller optical zone to create a smaller treatment zone and therefore push more plus into the peripheral pupil and ideally create more blur on the retina. So for a standard lower minus patient, you're going to select the 5.5 optic zone. If you're dealing with a patient over minus 4, where we need a very flat base curve to cornea relationship, then you're going to go down to a 5 millimeter optic. If you had started with the 5.5 and we're not getting good myopia control, the patient is actually increasing in myopia, then you can redesign the lens with a smaller optic zone. If the patient started with a 5.0 millimeter optic zone and we're struggling with aberrations, the patient just feels those increased aberrations that are created, then we can go up to a 5.5 or even switch over to the larger 6 millimeter optic zone in the B-free. Let's apply these parameters, our 11.2 diameter and our 5.5 optic zone. Then the software will reconstruct the lens and lay it on the corneal surface. The next step is we can click our cursor in the center and see that optimal 5 to 10 microns of apical clearance that we desire under an ortho-K lens and certainly under a B-free or CAT-MC. Then we see in the mid-periphery this increase in fluid thickness in the reservoir of the lens where the reverse curve and the optic zone meet or the base curve and the reverse curve meet. So this deep reservoir here then you have your reverse curve coming back toward the eye surface and this alignment with the peripheral cornea that gives us the centration, gives us the stability, that traps in this fluid that gives us the hydraulic force. Then lastly, you have your edge lift that is designed to allow the lens to move slightly on eye or during REM sleep so that when it moves and hits flatter surface out here, it won't be creating any staining or agitating the conjunctiva or peripheral cornea. And of course we need that edge lift to allow for tear exchange when it's in both the open eye and closed eye uh, environment and also to assist the patient with removal, having something for that lid to grab onto when we're attempting to pop the lens off. So here's the relationship that we see across the flat meridian. Edge lift, landing at 9 o'clock, reservoir of fluid, a lens close to the center but not touching, reservoir of fluid, alignment with the cornea at 3 o'clock, and then our edge lift. Let's take this axis line to the vertical. Remember, this was a patient that had 33 microns of sagittal differential, meaning you're going to have depth or vault of the lens across the steep meridian of the eye. And we see that where 
the alignment curve is hanging up above the surface rather than being in clo closer apposition with the eye. So even though this is a moderate corneal astigmatism, the peripheral cornea is toric enough, the sagittal differential being over 30 microns, would suggest that a toric lens might create better alignment. So let's switch over to the toric CAT MC and apply. And notice that creates a deeper, steep meridian of the lens, giving you an alignment that's much closer to the eye surface, allowing this tiny little fluid layer that will provide tear exchange and good movement in both closed eye and open eye. So we're looking at a much better relationship with the flat meridian and the steep meridian that should create a, a stable contact lens, a comfortable contact lens, a lens that will produce the hydraulic force that we need in both the flat and the steep meridian. Then over here you have the data that the B-Free and CAT MC designs require to be able to construct the lens the flat RO or the flat radius of the cornea right in the center. Then the steep radius of the cornea across this meridian, but the radii again right in the center. The flat eccentricity, the rate of corneal flattening across the horizontal and in the steep, the rate of corneal flattening across the vertical. And that helps us to construct the ideal first lens. So this is the way to acquire the appropriate maps. We want eight topographies prior to creating the composite eye. So when you're doing your baseline capture, it's two visual axis captures, patient looking right down the axis of the instrument, right in the center of the circle. Then it's going to be two captures on the geometric axis, having the patient look one, two, or three rings in toward their nose. And then you're going to take one capture in each of the principal directions. It's typically about three to four rings you need to look nasal temporal up and down to push the placido reflection to the opposing periphery. So with those eight maps, then we can merge them together using the composite eye. So merging them together going up to analysis and composite eye and that will take all of those topographies create a good averaging effect in the center meanwhile filling in the far periphery that gives you your composite capture then we'll assess the sagittal differential to understand when we should go symmetric less than 30 microns of sagittal differential we would use a symmetric B free or CAT MC greater than 30 microns or greater, we would use the toric. Then we're going to convert that composite by going up to analysis and ideal eye, convert it to a symmetric surface. Then once that's created, we can go to home and contact lens and select the B free or CAT MC depending on the type of optics that we want. For adult vision, we would typically use the B-Free with its six millimeter or larger optic zone. For children in myopia control, we would use a 5.5 optic zone for children less than four diopters of myopia. For children four diopters or greater, we would use the five millimeter optic zone. So 5.5, for patients under four diopters myopia, patients four diopters or greater, we'd use the five millimeter optic zone. I hope this video has been helpful in explaining the optimal way to capture uh, topographies for any ortho K lens, but then also some of the considerations that are specific to the B-Free and the CAT MC designs.